Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. It's a precious role. We take it uh, very uh, uh, seriously, and we're grateful for it. And the program tonight is part of our role as America's town hall. This is the one place in the country where citizens of diverse constitutional perspectives can hear the best arguments on the constitutional questions that transfix America, are in the news, and suffuse our history, and make up your own minds. We're talking about the most timely question imaginable, the future of free speech in America. Just this morning, the Supreme Court heard important arguments on a case that will decide whether corporations have the same religious liberties under the First Amendment as natural persons, and we're going to discuss that and many, many other questions. I want to ask you to look at our website, constitutioncenter.org, for upcoming programs. On Thursday, Alan Dershowitz will come to discuss his life in the law. We have uh, Senator uh, Jim DeMint, Lynn Cheney, Justice John Paul Stevens in one of his only public appearances about his great new book, and just a thrilling series of fall programs. I'm also especially excited that tonight we are presenting this partnership with uh, the uh, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, or FIRE. Uh, FIRE's mission is to defend and sustain individual rights, including freedom of speech, legal equality, due process, religious liberty, and sanctity of conscience at America's colleges and universities. It was during my first weeks on the job that Greg, who you'll meet tonight from FIRE, came to me and said we should present a panel on the future of free speech. And we've really assembled the dream team of uh, free speech commentators and thinkers here tonight. This is an ideologically diverse panel. Broadly, I think you may find that two of our uh, panelists may be uh, more ardent in their defense of the traditional America, American uh, free speech uh, position than others, but I'm not gonna tell you which ones, and we're gonna <laughs> expect, us, expect them to defeat uh, our yet. expectations. We don't know, maybe, maybe we will change our minds after listening to each other. <laughs> Let me briefly introduce them to you, and then we're gonna get right to it. Uh, Dr. Stanley Fish is the Florsheimer Distinguished Visiting Professor of Law at Cardozo Law School. He's well known to all of us as a contribu contributor to the Opinionator blog for the uh, New York Times. Uh, Greg Lukianoff, as I mentioned earlier, is the President of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, a member of the uh, Bar of the U.S. Supreme Court, and author of Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship and the End of the American Debate. It's recently come out in paperback and it's great. Please get it after the show. My old uh, friend and uh, co-clerk, uh, Eric Posner, is Kirkland and Ellis Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Chicago, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a prolific commentator on international law, constitutional law, and comparisons of American and international attitudes toward free speech. And finally, I just have to say my old, old friend, it's such a joy to welcome you, Jonathan, to the National Constitution Center. We go way back in Washington, D.C. Uh, Jonathan is the most uh, prominent and important defender of gay marriage in this country, as well as one of the most persuasive and eloquent defenders of free speech. And his reasoned and calm voice uh, expressed in this beautiful book, which has been recently reissued uh, in paperback, Kindly Inquisitors, and in other works uh, and in uh, many articles uh, has greatly enriched public debate. So welcome to the National Constitution Center. Thank you. I'm gonna begin with you, Jonathan. Um, yesterday, the Supreme Court delayed a decision about whether to hear a very important case. It raises the question whether a photographer can refuse to photograph gay weddings because of her religious objections and claims that religiously motivated individuals can refuse to serve gay people or perform gay marriages are popping up with increasing frequency. The biggest theme of your recent writing, and in fact you have a new afterword to Kindly Inquisitors, has been that the First Amendment is good for gay people, that a regime that allows hate speech is good for minorities in general, and the progress of gay rights in the past two decades proves it. Do these recent cases cause you to re-examine that thesis? No, they don't. Um, I am not the best person to comment on the legalities of these cases. I don't know the, I don't know the case law. Um, 
but, but let me give you a personal perspective on, on how I think about these cases. There, there's a bunch of these cases, and they all involve, one way or another, the clash of religious conscience with anti-discrimination law, which often means homosexuality, gay marriage. Um, in the case of the Obamacare law, it means contraception. Uh, and there's a lot of these. The other day, there's a case in Colorado now. It's not a legal case. A suit has not been filed, but a Christian dog walking company fired a customer because the customers agreed with legalizing marijuana. They said, get your dogs and get out of here. We're not going to walk them anymore. Um, so I regret this. This is not the kind of society I want to live in where people are picking these fights. I've urged the gay community publicly and privately. The right answer to this is sensible, reasonable accommodations worked out through the political process. I worry that by litigating all this stuff and turning it into First Amendment jurisprudence, which locks in one answer or another forever, we lose the flexibility to negotiate. There is no reason we need to have one national rule. Different states and cities should be striking different balances. And gay people, for example, or abortion rights activists, for example, and people of religious faith should be sitting down at the table forced to negotiate over statutes that will strike balances. That's the right way to handle it. Wonderful. Um, Greg, you have spent the past 13 years defending free speech on campus. Uh, how do the battles today look different than they did when you started? And what are the most important battles today? You recently noted that you've been maintaining a growing list of 120 speaker controversies <laughs> in recent years, including high-profile disinvitations or decisions by speakers to withdraw under pressure, including Ben Carson, Geraldo Rivera, Ann Coulter, and so forth. Um, wh wh what's the pressure point of these free speech battles on campus today, and how has it changed in the past 13 years? Well, my journey... Um, <laughs> so you can share with us. Uh, ...has been... I, I went to law school. I was the weird law student who went to law school specifically to do First Amendment law. Um, I, my passion was free speech. I can get into why I came to that, but that's why I went to law school. I specialized in it. I interned at the ACLU. I took every class that Stanford offered on freedom of speech. I even did six additional credits on censorship during the Tudor dynasty because I loved it so much. Oh, beautiful. And no matter, uh, and even with all that preparation, um, when I showed up uh, and became the first legal director of FIRE back in 2001, I was stunned by the kind of things that can get you in trouble on the modern college campus. And 13 years later, I am still stunned on a daily basis. So that's one of the reasons why I wrote on Learning Liberty, is because I got really tired of people saying, well, that's one example. I'm like, okay, how about the following thousand that I can point out? So I talk about dozens of examples in the case, not to completely exhaust people, just by, by sheer, number, uh, sheer number of examples. But one trend there's a, of a lot of trends that, that I've noticed is it felt like when I first started back in 2001, 2002, that um, universities, when they were censoring students, they would at least make some kind of bow to some kind of higher purpose to what they were doing, even if it was entirely disingenuous. They would say basically, well, don't make fun of tuition prices or don't make fun of the dean in the name of, I don't know, tolerance and diversity. Like they would actually invoke these things, and sometimes sincerely, sometimes for, for the greater good, but sometimes half sincerely. It seems like in the past two years I've seen more cases where they're not even bothering with that, where it seems to be this very, there's, a, there's been a lot of these very old fashioned examples of just don't criticize the university, I don't really have to justify it, just do as I say, which I think is, is partially a, a result of a lot of bureaucratization and a lot of, uh, you know, just getting used to power over a long time. With regards to disinvitation season, um, that, that's our name for uh, every time around this time of year, um, a lot of speakers end up getting disinvited from campus. <laughs> or they're forced to withdraw their names. And we, we, we've been laughing darkly within the fire office about disinvitation season that happens every year. And that's not so much a First Amendment problem as a cultural problem. I think that we're teaching students to think that if you don't like the opinion of someone who's speaking there, you don't challenge them. You chase them off. You get them disinvited. And I think that's the wrong way to think about open discourse. Great. Um, Eric, uh, not long ago, um, the President of the United States and the President of Egypt disagreed about how to treat a prominent free speech issue. This was the video, Innocence of the Muslims, that was alleged to have led to the Benghazi riots. And uh, under uh, pressure, the President of Egypt said this has to be removed because it blasphemes uh, a group of believers in an entire religion, which is illegal in Egypt. And the President of the United States, while defending Google's and YouTube's right to post the video, called on the companies voluntarily to remove the video 
because he said it was causing violence. In fact, Google and YouTube uh, and uh, Facebook refused to remove the video because they concluded it did not violate their terms of service, which prohibits criticizing a religion but not a religious leader. And later evidence uh, suggested that the video might not have caused a riot. Are American and uh, non-American free speech uh, traditions, they're obviously very different, and America is more protective of free speech. Is that a good or bad thing? And, and did uh, Google do the right thing? Um, it's a bad thing. So uh, I teach international law, and, and one of the things that I've been struck ab about again and again is the difference between American norms and norms in other countries. Um, and, and this is sometimes uh, put under the rubric of American exceptionalism. And one way that the United States is really quite different from other countries is, is its commitment to uh, free speech. Now, you can, you can make three distinctions. So there are countries like Egypt and, you know, Authoritarian countries, they obviously don't like free speech, and there's no reason to want to be like them. But European countries have a different attitude toward uh, free speech uh, from that of the United States. Uh, Europeans tend not to be as absolutist. Uh, they take seriously uh, the um, fact that uh, people can be offended by speech, that it can cause turmoil, as illustrated by, the, uh, by this video. Um, and, and what's uh, striking is that uh, there are these human rights treaties which have provisions about freedom of expression, but the provisions are much narrower than you find in the United States. The provisions will say, you know, speech, free speech is, is, a, is a right subject to various constraints such as public morality and, and public order. So I think President Obama did a reasonable thing. Uh, this video was causing foreign policy problems for the United States because the United States was trying to improve relations with uh, Muslim countries. And he wanted to at least show uh, people in these countries who don't share our views about freedom of speech that we respect their views. Um, now, he couldn't obviously order Google to take down uh, the video. If he had had that power, it would have been an interesting question whether he, sh he should use it. But I think people are wrong to uh, criticize President Obama in this case on the grounds that basically the rest of the world, you know, doesn't share our views and they just have to, you know, get with the program. They've got to be like, like us, and if they're not like us, well, you know, who cares about them? I, I don't think that's a, a practical way to run foreign policy, and, but I do think, I think the problem here is that we, we're so, uh, um, we love our First Amendment so much and, and we, when we think very proudly of American traditions about freedom of speech, which actually only go back a few decades, not to the beginning. But, uh, w but this is such a part of American self-identity that it's very hard to make compromises, uh, even when they're warranted, and, and, and that's a problem. Great. And uh, Professor Fish, you've written a book on free speech called There's No Such Thing as Free Speech and It's a Good Thing Too, in case you wondered where. Uh, Professor Fish falls on this uh, spectrum, I've suggested. Uh, and now you've written a book on academic freedom, versions of academic free freedom from professionalism to revolution. What, in your view, is the relationship between these two concepts? Before I answer, I want to say how much I agreed with what Eric just said. Uh, once uh, you all recall Salman Rushdie uh, and the fact that a fatwa was issued uh, against him uh, for the writing of the Satanic Verses. Uh, I was at a conference, uh, a humanistic conference. Uh, don't go to humanistic conferences. <laughs> <laughs> but I was at one nevertheless. I used to be in that game. And this topic came up, and someone stood up in the audience and said, and meant it, this was not a joke, what's the matter with those Iranians? Haven't they ever heard of the First Amendment? <laughs> That's exactly. Now, the relationship between academic freedom and the First Amendment, I think, can be simply described. Academic freedom, free speech as established by the First Amendment, um, is an inclusive democratic, uh, uh, is an inclusive democratic idea. Academic freedom is a notion that only lives coherently within an academic structure which is determinedly exclusive. What academics do, our trade, is to make judgments on each other. Uh, and what we do is not foster speech or flourish or, or, or uh, ensure that it will flourish. Rather, it is the case that we devise mechanisms 
by which we give ourselves the right, at least those of us who have tenured positions, to say who can and who cannot speak freely. Another way of looking at the difference between academic freedom and free speech is to think of the topic of Holocaust denial, uh, which has been with us uh, for quite a while and will be with us, I, I predict, uh, for a very long time. Uh, Holocaust denial in our society, under the strong absolutist uh, First Amendment views that Eric referenced, uh, is something that cannot be stigmatized or oppressed. Holocaust denial can be promoted on websites, radio programs, videos, and so forth. But in the academy, Holocaust denial is interdicted. It's not that the question of Holocaust denial never arises in the academy. It's rather that when it does arise, it never arises as a live option for belief. It's not something in the academy which is regarded as an alternative uh, position that one might sincerely have. Rather, Holocaust denial is regarded as one might view flat earth denial or Elvis is dead denial. That is, it's the property of kooks and crazies. Therefore, although you can write about it and get a position for writing about it in a history department or get promoted in a history department for writing about it, if you advocate it, you will neither get hired or promoted. So why is there this difference? Again, it's the difference between a structure of inclusion and a structure of exclusion. But, and this goes again to uh, Eric's point, and we didn't talk about anything ahead of him, Eric's point that the First Amendment that we now have, which I would call, not in a friendly tone, a libertarian First Amendment. The First Amendment that we now have is a recent development, and I would say that it only emerged fully in 1964 uh, with the famous case New York Times versus Sullivan, uh, which is a case dear to the heart of all free speech ideologues and which I think was one of the worst decisions um, ever issued by the Supreme Court. Now, before New York Times versus Sullivan, it was possible, and in fact, it was done by the Supreme Court, to withdraw constitutional protection from speech, either because of what it did, the effects it had, or because of what it said. There was a contents uh, test and then the effects test. The effects test uh, was called the bad tendency test at the beginning of the 20th century. The idea was that some forms of speech have a bad tendency. They incite illegal activity, don't deserve protection. That was then followed, as many in this room will know, by the Holmes-Brandeis clear and present danger test, which said, well, yeah, the effects may be bad, but we should, we should wait until we see how bad they would be, see when the danger is imminent, and then step in but still an effects test. The content test was a test which said, look, there are some forms of speech which are trivial and worse, and they don't deserve constitutional protection. I have a quote here, one of my favorite quotes from a 1942 cases. Some utterances are no essential part of any expedition of ideas and are of such slight social value as a step to truth that any benefit derived from them derived from them is outweighed by the social interest in order and morality. All that changed in 1964 when the New York Times uh, versus Sullivan uh, Court uh, said that all speech must be protected independently of either its content or its effects uh, and independently of whether it was defamatory or it caused distress of a variety of kinds because the important thing said the uh, New York Times versus Sullivan Court was to keep the, the, uh, keep the conversation going, going in a wide open, open, robust, and uninhibited way, which yeah, I've... We, which, we've been encouraged to have a conversation right, here. Right, which I've sometimes called the John Wayne theory of the First Amendment, and that was the beginning of the end of everything. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why actually, the world ended in 1964. Actually... It was the beginning of the beginning of everything. Let me remind you. <laughs> let me remind you what the world was actually like in 1954, when mm -hmm. um, a magazine you've never heard of, because I hadn't until 
out yesterday called One, published in LA. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Good for you. <laughs> this was One. He Anyone heard of this magazine? Right? O-N-E. <laughs> was the first openly gay intellectual magazine. And it was not publishing sex ads or anything like that. It had articles, and it had short stories, and it was openly gay. And the United States Post Office shut it down because the content was unacceptable to society. They took it off the stands. They said, you can't mail it. And just for good measure, the specific issue that they banned had as the cover story, quote, you can't say that, an attack on the <laughs> censorship policies of the US government. <laughs> That's what they were doing. In 1958, in a per curiam two-line decision, there's no reasoning at all, the Supreme Court struck down what the Postmaster General had done, creating a wide open field for debate of gay rights in this country, a position considered obscene and dangerous to children in my lifetime, and allowing the field open for people like me to make our arguments and eventually to win those arguments. This I think you could win the arguments by gaining control of the political process since that's the way the arguments are always won anyway. And in fact, no. that's what's happening now. Yeah. Ideas won the arguments. We had no political Ideas power. Ideas never won anything. Yeah. Here, here I'm, I'm delighted that this first panel, first of all, doesn't need a moderator. <laughs> no, go, go away, <laughs> go away. <laughs> Put on my potted plant. Uh, <laughs> and that the debate has been joined so fiercely. And in fact, we've had fighting words. So now we know <laughs> where everyone stands. Yeah. And we Can have- Can I shout fire now? <laughs> this is, is a great. I, I, I really, please come back because these self-moderating panels are so much easier to uh, preside over. We have on my left the two First Amendment libertarians, as <laughs> Professor Fish put it, who defend the American free speech tradition which holds generally that speech can only be banned if it threatens and is likely to cause imminent lawless action. And on the right, we didn't actually plan this. We have, I don't know, I'm going to call them the First Amendment dignitarians. You can choose another. You can fight with me about that. Contrarians. Who are, who are contrarians who are defending a more European notion that speech that blasphemes groups or offends their dignity may be banned, uh, as in Europe, where Holocaust denial can be banned. I want to ask Greg, as a libertarian, to respond to the dignitarian's argument that the Innocence of the Muslims video should have come down. After yeah. all, the Google people weren't convinced that there was evidence of imminent threats. In retrospect, it turned out they were right. The video didn't cause action. Yeah. Did those Google kids, many of these, these are 22 years old in flip-flops who were basically <laughs> making a decision in the middle of the night, did they make a better decision than the President of the United States? <laughs> I, I actually wrote two very long articles in the wake of the, um, uh, the, the decision to take the video, to, to go after the videos, because almost as soon as the videos went up, I mean, pe people who um, are contrarians on free speech on campus are actually, in my experience, in the mainstream. 59% of campuses maintain what we call red light speech codes, um, ones that uh, are, would be laughably unconstitutional. Every single time they've been challenged in a court of law, they've been defeated. So in a sense, Stanley Fish has won on campus. Um, they, they don't, uh, the, the extent to which free speech is really appreciated on campus, I've seen a you know, marked decline within my own 13-year-long uh, thir career. And what, you know, there, there's an advantage to doing you know, six credits on the, on the history of Tudor censorship. One of them is remembering where, where we came from. And the idea, the spectacle of academics arguing essentially for blasphemy laws, saying that we should be banning speech uh, because it offends someone's religious faith. And I remember someone challenged me on this and I said, no, no, really, blasphemy was the first freedom. You're not actually free until you can question someone else's faith, someone else's deepest beliefs. And that was so well established by the time that, uh, because of the, uh, the horrors of the, the religious wars in Europe, that by the time you get to the, uh, get to the establishment of the First Amendment, it, it's relatively well taken for granted. Now, to the argument of whether or not we um, uh, just recently started taking free speech uh, seriously. I also dismissed that argument as well. I mean, as, as Stanley well knows, uh, um, Milton was writing about free speech in 1644. And I'd like to point out that that means that pretty much as long, almost as soon as the masses had the power to communicate ideas, they were, uh, they were arguing for free speech. And the tradition of John Lilborn, the people that I used to cover during the Tudor dynasty, even, uh, even long before Milton. So free speech was, it was a powerful uh, weapon and a powerful goal um, th throughout uh, intellectual history, starting as soon as people were allowed to speak it out loud. What, uh, what, what, they're com what uh, Stanley is conflating is that the First Amendment was not found to uh, apply to the states um, until 1925. 
And that is because of something called the Slaughterhouse Decision. It couldn't actually have applied before the 14th Amendment, which came after the Civil War. Unfortunately, there was a really stupid decision by the Supreme Court that prevented that from actually having full force. Really, well, not quite full force until uh, 1925, when it started to be incorporated through the Due Process Clause of the Constitution. But from 1925 on, you see this progress, in my opinion, progress, um, towards <laughs> Uh, be, be, uh, be better and better protections of free speech with a little dip in the, uh, in the second Red Scare in the early 1950s. But of course, I see 1964, I, I see uh, Times v. Sullivan as being this wonderful moment. And when people argue against it, the Obama administration argues against Times v. Sullivan. Can you imagine a, a Rand Paul or a Sarah Palin being able to sue a journalist because they said something that they uh, that might be vaguely critical of them. That's what they're arguing for. They're arguing for a right of, of, of politicians to scare the hell out of journalists with threats of, of, of defamation. It's an incredibly good decision, and the idea that, uh, and, and I'm always puzzled by people opposing it. Do, you, do we want our politicians to be able to sue us for saying mean things about them? Well, I don't. Defaming, defaming them is not the same, same thing as saying but, mean oh, things you can, to you them. Can defaming is lying about them. Well, no, under the standard of New York Times v. Sullivan, you have to make reference to the very opinion that you're decrying, because it, it, that, that's where the actual malice came from. So, so there's this flourishing political culture in Europe where they have strong defamation oh. laws. Right. Uh, and those places aren't less democratic than the United States. Correct. They might be more democratic, because people who might otherwise be deterred from entering politics by the kind of slimy uh, media system that we have mm -hmm. uh, can go into it, you know, not having to worry about uh, being defamed or, uh, or uh, just, humiliated I, in, in various ways. I call, I call this Europe worship. Um, my, uh, my, <laughs> I see a lot of that here in America. <laughs> my, my dad grew up in Yugoslavia. My mother's British. I spent a lot of time over there. And, it, I, and it's funny. Yugoslavia, I'm not worshiping. <laughs> and it's funny how much, it, how much it mystifies Brits and my friends about how much you'll hear sort of like, wow, they, uh, Europe has such great laws with regards to speech. We would never tolerate their national security laws. Th those by themselves are crazy. The, and these are laws that are in Canada and Australia and Britain. And the, re and the, the, the recent... Um, but, uh, but why wouldn't... I mean, these are not police states, right? Canada is not a police state. It, it's not an authoritarian <laughs> system, right? The, well, but what is, the, what is the harm that's taking place in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the, the concrete harm that's taking place well, in... People say, among other things, there's a whole lot of chilling going on over there. <laughs> that, for example, it's getting mighty hard to criticize someone of the Islamic faith, for example. Yep. There are reasons both legal and extra legal for that, but people say there's a lot of chilling effect and new laws about blasphemy just the other day. I happen to have in my pocket, by mere coincidence, <laughs> <laughs> Belgium the other day, I, was, I came determined to read this because it's so interesting. Belgium has passed a law just the other day against uh, advocating sexism. Uh, for purposes of this act, the concept of sexism will be understood to mean any gesture or act that is evidently intended to express contempt for a person because of his gender or regards them as inferior or reduces them to their sexual dimension, which has the effect of violating someone's dignity, either in public meetings or in the presence of several people or through documents printed or sold, or even in documents that have not been made public. Was, was the so, law passed? Yeah, this is, was passed. This is law. That's a, that's so a look, silly okay, law. So, so I but take your point. there's lots of silly laws in Europe right that's now. That's a silly I, I law. I take your point. These are not police states, yeah. and, and Europe's a wonderful yeah. place. There's a lot you can do before you run into serious trouble. <laughs> exactly. But, but as a member of an actual minority group, I would rather be here where I don't have to worry about some prosecutor coming after me because he doesn't like what I said. Mm -hmm. Let me pick up something that Greg said about Milton. He was referring to Milton's 1644 tract, Aria Pagetica, where, as Greg indicated, there are extraordinarily powerful celebrations of the freedom of speech. In fact, some of them are chiseled on the wall of the New York Public Library. Two-thirds of the way through that track, Milton pauses yes. and says, of course, I didn't mean Catholics. Yes. Them we burn. It's true. Now, <laughs> he does exclude papists. Now, what I want to say is that everybody has a kicker up his sleeve. <laughs> if it's not Catholics, it's something. Nat Hentoff spoke absolute free speech talk for a long time until a disciple uh, of Farrakhan's began going around in campuses saying things that Hentoff found hateful, and then he said, we can't have that. What I want to say that the we can't 
have that position is not only a possible position, not only a sensible position, that structurally and philosophically it is in fact the position that everyone has, even if they're denying it. Let me first say that we're going to take a vote on this at the end of this great <laughs> panel, and you're going to have to decide whether you're for the libertarians or dignitarians, so listen closely. Also, those of you who haven't passed up audience questions uh, can do so. My uh, question is, um, is this um, debate between the libertarians and dignitarians and who's law going to prevail being made obsolete by technology? Here the deciders were not the president of Egypt and were not President Obama, but these 22-year-olds in flip-flops right. who are the first responders in Dublin and uh, India and, and uh, places like that who report up to the top lawyers at Google and Facebook. Uh, and the First Amendment doesn't bind Google and Facebook. Yeah. So really, is this an academic discussion? Because the decision is going to be made not by courts enforcing the First Amendment, but by young lawyers at internet service providers. Uh, Greg. Well, uh, I mean, for me, what's the most interesting about that is that we're starting to see, and I, and I look at the, the harm arguments and all of these hackneyed arguments for or against freedom of speech, and I realize one of the things that the information science folks, the, the Facebooks and the Twitter people actually get almost better than anybody, is that the most fundamental value of speech is not the uh, producing the platonic form of truth. It's not because discussion will actually let us understand what the form of truth is. It's the fact that I now know that you're angry at me. It's the fact that I know what, price, what the price of rice over there. It's now I know what the trends are. All of these little t truths that can actually be revealed. And I think by, if you look at Twitter, you have an unparalleled chance to see something that is as close as we're ever going to get to the collective unconsciousness of the species. And it's what a discouraging <laughs> statement. <laughs> it is. Just, it is. But it's important to know what we're like for good and for bad. I think that this is important information. And this really primitive idea that what, what I, make, I make fun of my own people for having what, uh, the, uh, for the British side, for having what I call sort of like, oh, so we're taking the, the dinner time response to unpleasant talk. We're just not going to talk about it. Meanwhile, knowing um, that people have bad opinions um, and, that, and how people respond to them or that people have strange ideas is incredibly valuable. The ostrich approach does not work. It cannot work. Well, we, we'll always know that, but I, I don't think technology will change anything because uh, it remains the case that you can, the government can bring lawsuits against internet service providers. It can uh, bring lawsuits against uh, Google and, and uh, require Google to take things down. Um, People, uh, most people, you know, there's a huge amount of stuff that's said on the internet by anonymous people that nobody pays any attention right. to, so there's no need to sue them, nobody cares what they say. Right. Um, if it's somebody who's, who, uh, like a politician or, or, a, uh, or, or a, a prominent person, uh, then everybody knows who he is and, and where you can uh, sue. You know, back at the early stage of the internet, the concern was actually the opposite, that um, there's this famous case involving Yahoo in France. Yahoo had Nazi memorabilia on their website, and the French government sued them, and the worry was, since Yahoo has, uh, you know, its website appears everywhere, that French, um, uh, I guess, defamation law would apply in the United States. That turns out not to be the case, because these uh, companies can control where, uh, you know, what appears in their websites in different countries. So I, I think it's a bit of a, re of a red herring. I, I don't think, these Google guys, uh, they can get sued just like anybody else. They can get fired just uh, like anybody else. I don't think it's going to change much. We've just seen Turkey shut down Twitter. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, what people forget is that the internet uh, actually operates because the government allows it to operate. It opens a lot of it, uh, it owns a lot of the uh, infrastructure. The NSA can tap into it and figure out what people are thinking and, and, and saying. And so uh, we're, we're not going to live in a libertarian uh, society. Professor Fisher, Eric says Turkey shut down Twitter. What happened then is Greek football fans had a habit of saying that Kemal Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey, was gay. He wasn't, as it happens, but uh, it's illegal to say that in Turkey because it's a form of defamation, not against gay people, but against Ataturk. Uh, the, um, <laughs> Which is against the law. Uh, Google was asked <laughs> to take it down. They initially refused. A Turkish prosecutor said, take it down uh, all over the world. Instead, Google just blocked access to Turkish users using their internet protocol addresses. And as a result, Google was banned from Turkey for a couple of years. Uh, pr pr Professor Fish, it was uh, the decider at Google who was woken up in the middle of the night. She has to decide, 
is this video actually blasphemous under Turkish law, in which case she'll take it down, or is it political commentary, in which case it'll stay up, and oh, by the way, she doesn't speak Turkish, and then multiply <laughs> that by people criticizing the Thai king in Thailand and you know, doing stuff that's illegal in India. These lawyers are making these decisions. Are you confident that they will make the right ones? No, I'm not confident that they will make the right ones any more than I'm confident that the you know, laws like the ones uh, that Jonathan uh, rehearsed uh, will no longer uh, be passed. What I am confident, however, is that the uh, strong free speech doctrine has no reality in fact. And I would, in, I would go back to a formula that the great judge uh, Learned Hand put forward that I'm sure everyone on this panel and many in the audience will know. It's a cost-benefit analysis, basically. He said, in matters of free speech, what you want to do is calculate the harm that will be produced by allowing the speech to flourish, and then balance that against the harm that will be produced by trying to regulate it. And that suggests that it's a case-by-case -case analysis and that you have to take account of the harms without entirely surrendering them to them, but not ignore them and therefore surrender to some abstraction. And for a book, some of you may know this book, that makes this argument more powerfully than any in recent years, I recommend Jeremy Waldron's book, The Harm in Hate Speech. He's a law professor at Oxford and NYU and a native New Zealander, so some kind of international flavor to his work. Walt Waldron's book is a powerful defense of Euro European hate speech laws, and yeah, he focuses- Yeah, it's a superb book. Is it uh, realistic in terms of taking account of who's making the decisions? Waldron envisions European regulators enforcing their will in European courts and so forth, but uh, really it's the terms of service of the internet service providers that are deciding things, is the ability of European regulators to enforce their will overtaken by this new technological world, even if you're persuaded by Waldron and the dignitarians? So you're asking about the technology and not about the Waldron argument? I'm, yeah, I'm saying is, you know, well, I'm saying are the dignitarians just missing the point? They can, they can claim that uh, the European approach oh, is no, better, I, I, but it can't be enforced. I, I agree with, with Eric on this. I think that uh, although there's a lot more tools for freedom of expression popping up as no one in this room needs to be reminded, there are also a lot more tools for monitoring expression popping up. So I think you know, one, one reason you always want to be on a panel with Stanley Fish, if, if you can, is within five minutes, he's going to go to the fundamental issues. <laughs> and the technology uh, does not begin to address the fundamental issues. And, and that's still very relevant. So what kind of society do we want to have? And what are the basic ground rules going to be? That's right. Greg, you, you talked about uh, Twitter as the what was your phrase, the collective voice of our unconscious <laughs> the collective, or something? The collective unconscious speech of the species. Collective speech unconscious of the species. Yourself, <laughs> by the way. Absolutely. So uh, there was a Twitter uh, scandal recently. There's one every week. Yep. The tweet heard, heard round the world. Uh, the media company IAC has fired the chief uh, PR executive. Right. She tweeted, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. Yep. Uh, there was a Twitter mob yep. uh, against her and... Uh, it was, she was called a racist, and she was fired. Um, you, John said technology doesn't change things, but you used to litigate these campus things on a case-by-case -case basis. Suddenly, the mob is global. Right. Would you defend her rights to say that, and how can you defend it in a world where the Twitter sphere yeah, goes, goes it, viral? It's a crazily unsympathetic case, and obviously, you, um, for, if you're a PR flack and you make, make a statement that's stupid, you're going to get fired for it. But what was interesting to me was the extent to which it turned into a um, out for blood cause for the people. She was on a, on a flight before she made it, and by the time she got off, she was an international uh, villain, um, negative celebrity. And I see this, the, 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 this happening a lot in the way we debate with each other, um, that essentially social media has let us speed up the way we argue, but it's also sped up polarization, and it's also sped up sort of a sense of sort of uh, tribalism. So I think that that some level the the ability to argue this quickly, I, I, I'm actually optimistic on this. I think it will teach us some amount of sophisticated lessons about what it actually means to live in a tolerant society, but I feel like right now we're going through some ridiculous growing pains where uh, Ryan Holiday wrote, wrote a good um, article about this recently called Outrage Porn, 
just calling BS on the fact that we are addicted to outrage. And, it's, and partially we do this because it's really fun for us, it really gets our juices going, we actually really like it. I particularly like the fact that, you know, that, that a lot of times I think we're harnessing, in, in the anti-bully movement, sometimes you end up seeing people harnessing really aggressive, I don't know, bullying energy to go after the, the, whatever target they're actually allowed to go after. So I think that's great conversation that we're having, as I was kind of alluding to, is teaching us a lot about our nature, and I wouldn't want to stop it unnecessarily necessarily for some, uh, for some idea that maybe we can somehow perfect ourselves, make ourselves different. I think we should actually take a long, hard look at who we actually are. Don't I, love, I just want to, I can't resist the, the, the idea of addicted to outrage recalls the definition of obscenity. It has to appeal to the prurient interest and be patently offensive. Kathleen Sullivan said yep. this means it has to turn you on and gross you out at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Fish on, yeah, on I, outrage. I agree with what Greg just said, and I think we, we all of us on this panel would want to distinguish uh, between the pressures that can be brought against speech, uh, which are social and cultural, and the legal uh, pressures or uh, uh, even regulations and criminalizations. So the congressman who recently said that nothing would uh, be lost to the world if the entire National Basketball Association were to be shut down, the only result would be an increase in street crime, uh, well, uh, when he said that, within 20 minutes, he had to, and this is our new favorite phrase in society, walk it back. <laughs> you know, I, I hope none of you are walking anything back. Uh, but, uh, but of course, he is paying a price, but it's not a, a price exacted uh, by any legal regime, uh, but it's a price uh, exacted uh, by uh, the cultural norms and senses yeah, of appropriateness. We all, we all do agree on that, and where you and I, I think, probably disagree is I think those cultural means are by far the best mechanism to discipline offensive and hateful speech, and then in fact the official means, when you get authorities criminalizing it, are counterproductive. Yeah, and I would say in response to that Brandeis-like statement, mm -hmm. that is the best, uh, Brandeis made two powerful statements. He said uh, the, the best, the remedy for, for bad speech is more speech, I'm only paraphrasing. Uh, and, and he also said sunshine is the best disinfectant. And my response to that is that the only counter argument is all of recorded history. Uh, <laughs> and that, for example, if you allow something like Holocaust denial uh, into the general atmosphere on the basis of strong First Amendment principles, what you will have is not Holocaust denial withering but growing, growing, and growing. It's so funny because basically like my whole argument, you know, partially because I grew up with a father who took 12th century Russian history very, very seriously, um, is that human history is such an argument for freedom of speech. When you start looking at sort of the, the, the blossoming of, 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 there was a great book about it, um, which talks about liberal science. Kindly Inquisitors is about sort of the rise of an intellectual system in which it's uh, questioning. <laughs> Uh, this, you buy it after the show, we're gonna have a book signing. That, that gets away from the time-honored, historically relevant uh, uh, theory that if you disagree with someone about fundamental issues, you better chase them off, you better behead them, you better set them on fire, you better ostracize them, you better get rid of them. That's, Sounds good. That's, <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's human nature. The idea of actually hearing out people who you disagree with is actually, I consider it a, like a technology. It's, a, it's an innovation. And what I find interesting is on campuses, I feel like the theory is going, going much more down the side of sophisticated thinkers don't believe in free speech. Meanwhile, when it comes to uh, results of tests of, of what happens when you let uh, pilots talk back to their co-pilots or co-pilots talk back to the pilots or you let um, institutions actually have a back and forth that actually is an incredibly healthy and, pr and productive thing. I think the evidence is just getting better and better for free speech, but we're losing more and more faith in it. So there's this matter of pilots died. call each other you know, racial epithets. <laughs> you don't want them saying that. And I'm sure if they did, they'd get fired instantly. But the feedback, the, the information feedback though. It, Some it, information, yeah. not all information. And that's the difference between us and you. We think it's an empirical <laughs> question. Uh -huh. Yes, that's right. Time and again, there is an empirical question uh -huh. whether the parameters for uh, speaking should be broadened or narrowed. Mm -hmm. It depends on the circumstances. In some campuses, you might want uh, broader uh, uh, speech, and others you might want narrower. In some historical periods, like the Weimar Republic, if you want to use a historical period, it was probably a bad thing mm -hmm. that speech was so free. And other pe or Rwanda is another example where uh, uh, freedom of expression over the radio led, led to led to a uh, Holocaust. There are other situations like the United States now where uh, extreme speech is not as harmful. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, uh, protections aren't as, uh, as as necessary as in these other places. But it's always an empirical question. It always requires a pragmatic judgment. These, mm -hmm. these, uh, this kind of fundamentalist approach you take based on some reading of history is just, uh, it's not appropriate under any circumstances. Uh, so I would, um, I would argue that in practice, these wonderful balancing tests, which we do so finely, mm -hmm very quickly devolve into lawsuits and heavy-handed governments and shutting down one and po people with political power using it against people without political power. But even setting aside that very big issue of can you really have these very fine-tuned tests that you talk about, I would argue empirically that history is absolutely on my side and I have lived it. I have seen in the past 20 years hate speech against homosexuals is a resource in the liberation of gay people in this country. I wouldn't have said that 20 years ago. A man died the other day named Fred Phelps, a crazy oh, person. Oh yeah, Fred. You know Fred <laughs> Phelps. Now what he did would be illegal in any country in Europe. He picketed military funerals with signs that said, God hates fags. That's pushing it even for me, guys, okay? That is way out there. The human rights campaign could have hired this guy in the sense that he did so much to expose the hate on the other side. It helps us when we have these people to argue against and when they are out there front and center, and we've got 20 years of an extraordinarily successful minority rights movement in this country to prove it. It can work that way sometime, as in the example that you've just given, but it can work in other ways at other times, which is what uh, Eric just said. And I think in, the con I think in this context of uh, anti-Semitism, uh, there's a general feeling in this country that anti-Semitism uh, at least uh, in the United States, uh, is a phenomenon of the past, or at least virulent anti-Semitism anti of the kind that was very active in the 30s and 40s in this country. And I happen to believe that that kind of virulent anti-Semitism could flare up tomorrow. Uh, and each time there's something like the Bernie Madoff case, I'm afraid that it will. This may simply be a feature of an unfortunate fact that I'm older than you are. <laughs> I have, to ask, I, <laughs> I have to ask uh, both the dignitarians and the libertarians about this morning's news. The Supreme Court heard uh, the most important free speech case of the year, the Hobby Lobby case involving the, qu the question of whether a religiously motivated owner of an arts and crafts store called Hobby Lobby could refuse to provide the contraceptive coverage required by the Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare to some, because of his religious motivations. Um, <coughs> Eric, uh, you know, the Supreme Court in the Citizens United case went from protecting the First Amendment rights of individuals to those of corporations on free speech grounds, and it may now extend it to religious rights of corporations as well. You were skeptical of American libertarianism in our earlier discussion. Uh, did the court go too far in Citizens United, and should it not extend this right in Hobby Lobby? Yeah, I think it did. I, I think this is a good counterpart to, counterpart to Jonathan's argument, which is that the First Amendment, as it's actually practiced in the United States, doesn't always uh, protect um, unpopular people or weak uh, groups. It, you know, can be, once the doctrine's in place, it can be used by anybody, including uh, by powerful corporations and by powerful groups. And in fact, uh, in this very interesting twist, uh, sometime from the 1970s to the 1980s, First Amendment absolutism went from being a liberal uh, position to a conservative position. And it's now allied to uh, property rights and um, uh, the, the rights of rights of corporations. Hobby Lobby, really a kind of religious freedom case, it's, it's in the same, uh, it's in the same ballpark. My view is, uh, you know, let the political process work out these compromises. Another thing that uh, Jonathan said early on, which, which I, I think is in tension with First Amendment absolutism, if you think people can work out these tensions between uh, religious conscience and uh, rights of women or um, um, other sorts of uh, uh, beliefs and, and concerns, then you don't want the Supreme Court and the other courts uh, applying this doctrine in order to uh, uh, defeat these compromises. Okay, I want a libertarian response to this power. The dignitarians are being consistent, at least Eric is, and he says that you shouldn't enforce the First Amendment too strongly in this context. Uh, you know, there are some ACLU liberals who defend Citizens United, and uh, d did, uh, are, are you barking up the wrong tree now that you've embraced the First Amendment, which is being used to strike down public accommodations laws and much of the regulatory state? 
Uh, I, I just think it's interesting. I, I, I never heard anyone say so directly that in the 70s and 80s, um, free speech became a conservative issue. Um, I, I really, I've always wanted to write an article, you know, saying, do you take that, liberals? Do you actually believe that this is no longer a liberal issue? And it's true that on campuses, I end up fighting a lot of people who come from the left side of the spectrum who believe that, who, who um, you know, think that free speech should be limited for any, any number of reasons, sometimes, uh, sometimes noble, sometimes not so much. Um, but I do think that part of the tactic, you know, labeling, for example, me a fundamentalist, when it comes down to it, I actually agree with the Supreme Court for the most part on, on freedom of speech issues. Um, and that, uh, or, or saying that, oh, but oh, now, now liberals don't believe in free speech because now conservatives can use it? What kind, I, I mean, that's, that's a kind of startling argument to me. That, oh, it, it's a negative thing that now, that, that a right is available to everybody? Just so I've got your position. Citizens United was correct and Hobby Lobby should be protected, you think? You I don't know enough about Hobby, Hobby Lobby. I do think Citizens United was correct. Jonathan? Um, to me, the core issue in Hobby Lobby isn't freedom of speech. It's what's a corporation. Uh, I tend to think corporations aren't people and that the First Amendment should not be applied to them as it should be to people, but it is not an area in which I specialize. Professor Fish, eager for your thoughts well, on this. Well, I want to once again uh, indicate my uh, agreement with Eric. Uh, as far as Citizens United goes, the topic that was discussed uh, in Stevens' 90-page dissent and dismissed um, in the majority opinion was the topic of corruption. That is, is it a matter of empirical fact that a great deal of money expended um, in the ways that are now possible will corrupt the political system? Or has a tendency to corrupt the political system? That's the kind of question that I think should be asked, not questions uh, which depend uh, on some abstract uh, uh, value like freedom of expression. But it's not such an abstract value. I mean, the masses opinion that you were talking about, the learned hand one, we, we, one of the reasons why you know, I make the point that we're not, um, uh, that, that it's not complete free speech absolutism is because when uh, even baked into the law that, we, that, we, uh, that I find academics being so dismissive of um, you, you know, when it comes to freedom of speech, there's uh, something called strict scrutiny that essentially under the right empirical circumstances, and, eat, and in, in co constitutional classes, you always come up with uh, the, the scenario where I'm like, well, you know, in that case, you know, when, when it's, that's how you end up with the incitement doctrine, that's how you end up with the, with, with the limitations on free speech that I think that the Supreme Court and we, uh, we agree with. But when it's this uh, extremely highly subjective uh, 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 standard that puts, uh, that gives uh, 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 also flawed people the power to decide which opinions they like and dislike, that is a formula for disaster that I watch take place on campuses all the time. And it's amazing how quickly administrators learn and students learn the code words they need to do to, to silence the, the opinions they disagree with. You just can't avoid subjective standards in the law. They're all over the place. Time, time place, and manner restrictions, which give uh, the government the authority you know, to say the protesters can be over here but not over there, or you, or you need a, a, a license uh, before you can march. Those uh, raise incredibly complicated questions, and judges have to decide, you know, somehow using very subjective standards. So the issue isn't really whether the standards are subjective or not. The issue is really whether, you know, how much uh, the democratic process will determine the extent to which people are permitted or not permitted to say whatever they feel. But a central part of the analysis in time, place, and matter law is viewpoint neutrality. And I think viewpoint neutrality and content neutrality are actually, when you get, the closer you get to uh, the expression of pure opinion. Um, that's when you're, you're, you're on, the, the, on the clearest ground with the law. And I think that's actually a very pragmatic standard. I think that works very well empirically. Make, uh, ma and also making the point that essentially my opinion um, is something that I should, uh, that I should be entitled to, is something that, um, uh, that, that can be very well maintained while at the same time um, trying to limit the influence of bias of power. Well, as you noted, I mean, even in, in defamation law, it's still possible to defame somebody, mm -hmm. especially if it's a pri private person rather than a public person. A def uh, when you defame someone, you're simply expressing your opinion. That means a, a judge somewhere is going to have to decide whether your opinion has enough evidence and is, is That's not entirely evidence. right, though. I mean, basically, when, when it comes to uh, defamation law, one of, the, one of the threshold questions is whether or not this is a false... Uh, assertion of fact, and, and that, that also makes perfect common sense. Am I saying I hate this person? That's not defamation. Am I saying I, I know for a fact this person is a pedophile? That's, that can be defamation, particularly if you knew, you, you knew, it, you knew it's lying. So a lot of these actually are less problematized than, than, I, than I think you're making them out to be. But of course, since we've had in defamation law the rise of the idea that uh, public officials uh, 
It's not that they can't be defamed, but it's much higher, a much higher standard to defame them. And then first it was, well, public officials, then it was those who have dealings with public officials. Right. Uh, and so I think that the effect here uh, was to weaken the possibility of defamation in what I would call the New York Times versus Sullivan spirit. Interesting. And, and we should note that uh, earlier this month, New York Times celebrated its 50th uh, anniversary. So happy birthday, New York Times, except from <laughs> Professor Fish. Uh, <laughs> we have a series of excellent audience questions, and I'm going to jump right in. Uh, what reassurance do we have that gay rights advocates will not trample on the First Amendment rights of those of us who have the nerve to disagree? Jonathan. There are a lot more of you than there are of us. <laughs> And that's the assurance you have. This will have to be worked out through the political process. But there are tons and tons and tons of Christians out there. And they're going to stand up for their rights. And they're going to be heard. Um, that's, that's how this process works. It's initially adversarial. But I am very confident, Jeff, that um, we can and will get to a point in 10 years where we'll have a pretty good, well-agreed upon set of rules that will have worked out for where these boundaries are going to be. Is there a limit to hate speech? What is it? Greg. <laughs> I don't believe in a hate, seat, uh, hate speech exception, um, neither does the Supreme Court. I do think that the court struck a pretty good balance in the Davis v. Monroe County opinion um, in outlining what harassment looks like. And harassment ends up looking like in the law, again, what I think that harassment sounds like in, in the English language. If it's severe, persistent, and pervasive, if, it, if it's targeted, if, it, if it's harassing somebody, um, then that's actually, I think, a good guideline for, for what you're not allowed to do. Merely having an a, a extremely obnoxious opinion, I think that should be protected. And actually, I'd, I would go farther. I think that it's one of the aspects of actually truly respect, uh, respecting pluralism is, is to uh, understand that, that sometimes uh, people from different classes, from different age groups, from different, uh, from different backgrounds is going to have an opinion that you might right now consider obnoxious. Uh, and actually, I want to take an example here. There's a great example of Bertrand Russell being, uh, being kicked out of Cooney um, when, he, when he had a job there in the 1940s before the doctrine of academic freedom became strong in the law. And he was kicked out because he thought that masturbation was okay, um, that he was tolerant of homosexuality, and that basically he was a modern sort of political liberal in a lot of different ways. And he was kicked out because these ideas were considered immoral. I think that pointing out that even uh, that without these systems that uh, opinions that we now absolutely take for granted um, have been affected in the fairly recent past is something that's really crucial to remember. No, I think that's wrong. That is, I certainly think that it was wrong of the, of the city to, that, kick out to, to kick out Bertrand Russell. But what makes it wrong is the fact that uh, the, uh, the city and then the, uh, the courts that uh, allowed it uh, were, how shall I put this? Uh, they were, what was happening was that Russell was being hounded out because of his political views not because of any expertise that he might have had in philosophy or mathematics. And that general principle, which was introduced uh, in 1915 by the American Association of University uh, Professors in its general statement on academic freedom and tenure, far predates New York Times versus Sullivan or any of its developments. It's a very strong distinction, which I entirely support, between academic work which is contemplative and exploratory um, and political action. Uh, and therefore, neither should professors should not perform political acts in their classroom, nor, the, nor should they be vulnerable to dismissal for political views they have outside their classroom. That's a 1915 idea. And so I don't think uh, it was the gift of New York Times versus Sullivan. What New York Times versus Sullivan has given us is Holocaust denial. Wait, do we all you know, agree? Oh. Yeah, do we all agree that Holocaust denial is a terrible thing that should never be allowed? Oh, I'm a Jew. Ask a different question. I'm a Jew. <laughs> I, I want to hear it. I think that banning Holocaust denial is like fixing global warming by breaking your thermometer. I think it depends heavily on context. If, if you've yeah. got a society which is generally tolerant and people are, uh, are um, uh, making all kinds of arguments about all kinds of crazy things, and this is one of the crazy arguments that people are making, it's probably not a big deal. But if you've got like a country with a small number of Jews and people don't like them and 
this idea is beginning to develop but hasn't right. quite yet uh, dominated uh, society. I think you can make a pretty good argument for Holocaust uh, law well, against problem, Holocaust Eric, denial. And I think, as you know, and I think Nazi oh, and I think Germany, you know, as a kind of penance for what happened in that country, mm -hmm. there was um, against uh, Holocaust denial and their sort of uh, laws against uh, uh, espousing Nazism are 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 pretty are pretty sensible. In that context, every other, other country, European the, the country, every other in, European country. The, the, a, a problem with that view is that in situations that are actually like the ones you describe, where there's a small embattled minority and a large hostile public, you're not going to pass laws that are going to protect the small minority. Right. You're going to get what you see in Uganda and Nigeria right now, which is the majority passing laws to oppress the homosexuals and, Russia. and using speech laws. And Russia using speech laws to oppress the homosexuals. It, so it depends. It, it does depends. depend because speech laws were used in order to allow the uh, the ragtag Nazi band headed by someone named Frank Colin uh, to march in Skok in Skokie, Illinois. The march, in fact, never occurred for other reasons. But if it had occurred, it would have occurred because of a strong First Amendment opinion written by a judge who practiced what I call the rhetoric of regret. He kept saying, this is awful. I hate it. It's going to do a lot of harm. I absolutely regret the fact that we have to allow these horrible things to happen. But there's the First Amendment. I, and there's I, a bad argument. And, and it's, it, it, I always get this when I, when I speak at, at, at universities. And I totally agree with Stanley um, that uh, when it comes to sort of does, uh, does someone who's espousing Holocaust denial views um, at, at, uh, measure up to academic standards and should get a job there? Of course not. It's, it's, it, it, it's horse malarkey. But that's one of the reasons why, it, uh, why I think that a lot of times when you uh, pass laws that ban it, um, you are actually are going to encourage it. Because, listen, if, if someone has to say, um, I believe the Holocaust didn't happen, okay, prove it, defend, defend that position. I can't. Here's the following 10,000 pictures. Oh, if you have to defend it out in public, it but just- But they it, can. It, it, have it, you it, ever it, gone it, on the websites? It, they it, defend it, it in three, 400 page volumes. It does not- it, I've and, read this stuff. And, and, if you ha and basically, if you're, a, if, if you're a paranoid fanatic, and basically your, your, whole, <laughs> your, whole, your, 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 your whole idea is to, is to say that uh, the Holocaust never happened, but I'm not allowed to say it because there's a conspiracy against me to say it, and then you never have to defend it. That's actually a formula for, for permeating the society. And I would actually say that Holocaust is more, uh, denial is more successful in countries that have uh, anti, um, uh, these kind of hate speech laws than it is in the U.S. where it's completely relegated to the fringes Hitler, because of free speech. You know, it's interesting to remember that, that the Weimar Republic had robust laws controlling speech and Shut, tried to shut down the Nazis, yeah. and that Hitler used those laws mm -hmm. to catapult himself to power. He I made himself a national symbol of resistance to this kind of yeah. thing. You don't want to give these haters the platform of a yeah. Supreme Court case. And, I, and that's simply one thing. I always love what, when people bring up sort of a Nazism as an argument for hate speech laws. I'm like, the Nazis were not a result for excess, uh, of excessive concern for individual rights. <laughs> Gentlemen, this self-moderating <laughs> panel yeah. <laughs> oh, are, are you still here? I, I, I'm still <laughs> here, and I'm loving every minute. We haven't heard from you not, in a while. I did not realize that a topic like the First Amendment, which everyone in America thinks that we all agree on, could generate such nuanced and thoughtful and provocative disagreement. It's time for a vote, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, we're going to reduce this complex and nuanced debate to yes, yes or no. Uh, can we have predictions from the panel? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Two-minute predictions. Who's gonna, are you going to win? No. Eric, <laughs> not on the vote. Eric, Greg, are you going to win? On the I reason. don't want to influence the vote. <laughs> uh, John, are you going to win? Uh, I'm going to say yes. Okay. <laughs> Who is persuaded by Professor Fish and Posner that the European dignitarian position on free speech is, is convincing? And who is, persuaded by, <laughs> who is persuaded by Jonathan and Greg that the American libertarian position is more persuasive? All okay, right, gonna, I have who, a question. Wait. Greg, you're <laughs> going to end the panel with a question to the audience. Thanks a lot. Raise, this is, raise this your is hand perfect. if you changed your mind. Uh, no, no, that's a good, that's a good oh, question. Oh, yes, thank you. Ma'am, you, you, which way did you switch? <laughs> All over the place. Oh. What a beautiful summary of the spectacular panel. Please join me in thanking our panelists.
I just want to like, thank you. Excellent. I just want to clap for the other people on the panel. That deserves a handshake. Oh, Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Wonderful. You're my favorite. Thank Please you. come and join us downstairs, buy the books, have some more drinks. Thanks for a great discussion. Come back soon. It's a lot of